Thank you, Lily, for this fantastic Grade 9 essay. For our purposes, you need to know that Poppies was the named poem and Lily has sensibly chosen Remains. Remains is one of my banker poems. I recommend this is one you always study because you will be able to compare it to every single poem about war. The exam question asks us to write about the effects of war on people. So Lily, as I taught my students, starts off with a thesis statement. Both poems, Poppies by Jane Weir and Remains by Simon Armitage, explore how war affects an individual. However, this is done in different ways, with Poppies describing a mother's experience, while Remains shows the impacts of war on a soldier who seemingly has no one to care for him. So she's cleverly pointed out similarities and differences. Now, this would have been even better if she told us why the poets were doing that. In other words, what does the poet make us want to think or feel or predict? For example, Remains can be seen as a protest poem about going to war in places like Iraq, or a protest poem about the way soldiers behave in war, or a protest poem about the way that soldiers are dealt with with their PTSD after war. Similarly, we can read Poppies as a protest poem about the propaganda around war that so attracts the son to enlist and go off and fight, and that so horrifies the mother. I'm doing this to dramatise how you would write about the author's purpose, and that immediately puts you in at least band five, which is at least a grade seven. In Poppies, a mother is consumed by the overwhelming grief over the death of her son. She constantly replays her memories of him, stuck in the past, no longer having a life of her own, without thoughts of war and violence. So although this is a very good account of the poem, it's not yet earning any marks because Lily hasn't gone into a quotation and started analysing it. And that's what the examiner wants to do. They want to give you AO1 marks for references and AO2 marks for analysis of language. So start there. Next, Lily says the entire poem is written without structure and feels incredibly intimate, which is true, perhaps, but she hasn't explained how the lack of structure makes it appear intimate. She could have written about how this is informal and we are normally informal with people with whom we are on good terms, with whom we are intimate. It's trying to make a connection with the reader, which is immediate, like we're listening to somebody we already know. But she didn't write that, so she's not really getting any marks for that yet. However, Lily does get into the next structural point. Weir also structures the poem around personal pronouns, such as I and you, throughout, which creates the sense that the poem is a eulogy and a collection of memories that the loving mother continuously replays in her head. Now that's excellent, that is a structural feature, how the poem is balanced between I and you. A eulogy is a poem written in celebration of someone's life, when they're dead, not when they're still alive. So the implication is that her son has died in the war. So this shows clear understanding at level four for AO3 context, and also we could argue for AO2 analysis of language, although structure is really about the context. So I'm going to keep the mark there. However, these memories may actually have taken over her brain as they have become violent and each is tinted with threatening imagery. So this sets up an analysis of AO2, doesn't it? We know that the quotations are going to prove this point. Embedded in the memories of her son leaving home is a semantic field of military language. And that's absolutely true. This is a phrase that I urge you to memorize. Whenever you write about semantic fields, examiners get incredibly excited because this is, and that is in level five where grade seven lives. With words such as spasms, bandaged, blockade, and blackthorns being used. The word spasms being used to describe an ordinary object such as paper highlights how the mother sees the world as dangerous and may even reflect the constant worry of her son her fear of his horrifying death. 
So this is top class analysis. Notice that all the words are single words. Having really short quotations allows you to embed them and is a kind of signal to the examiner that you know how to write well and so they automatically want to mark you higher. We can see how apart from blackthorns they are all part of a military language. So they come from that semantic field. Now, because there are so many quotations linked together, this is now thoughtful AO2 analysis. Now, AO1 awards references to the text, and because there are so many in this paragraph linked together, this is at least thoughtful for level 5. The nouns blockade and blackthorns again highlight how she is demonising her day-to-day -day life, as a blockade being a military tactic and blackthorns reflecting the barbed wire along the trenches. So this analysis is excellent for AO2, but she hasn't really proven how this demonizes the mother's own life. After all, these descriptions are about what her son is wearing and his hair. So this is not yet convincing and can't get into level six. The mother's life seems to have been remade as she no longer has any time frame other than from when her son left. This is shown as the poet uses vague time frames, such as before and after, which show the only focus in her life is the time her son leaves and how nothing else is important. This is actually a brilliant bit of analysis. I love it because I'd never noticed this before. Before and after is a bit like BC and AD when we refer to Christ. We can see how they balance either side of this momentous occasion when her son left, both literally when he's left the house, but also more permanently and metaphorically he's left through dying. Well, at least that's the implication. We don't know if that's the case, but it's a brilliant inference. So this clever analysis of time gets a really high mark for AO2. I'm convinced by it. I'm putting it in level six. The overwhelming impact of war is also felt by the soldier in the poem Remains. Simon Armitage describes a soldier in Iraq who has shot someone who was possibly defenceless and now cannot escape the memory of it. His mind forces him every day to see the blood shadow of the man he killed on his patrol. This is a metaphor for the stain left by the man's insides on the street. But the word shadow reflects how the image is haunting the man like a shadow as we can never get rid of them. So this is a really cool comparison telling us that this soldier is haunted just like the mother is haunted in poppies. But an easy way to get extra marks here is by looking at the methods. So one method here is the introduction of doubt and the other method is the one spotted. It is a metaphor. Now we could have gone back and said well spasms is being used metaphorically, blackthorns is a metaphor for the boy's hair and blockade is also being used metaphorically. So comparing the methods in this way would have got us into level six for the AO2 methods mark. Even when the soldier has returned home, he is plagued by memories of the murder and he bursts again through the doors of the bank. This is the memory the soldier keeps replaying of the looter leaving the bank, but also metaphorically bursting through his mind. He has tried to keep his mind locked and separated but the man violently bursts through it each night. So this is a very good bit of analysis of the quotation. It's gone into depth, so it's getting a high AO2 mark. It is at least thoughtful because it looks at the implications of a particular word, bursts. Eventually, the soldier recognizes his mind as the true enemy when he says that the man is dug in behind enemy lines. Dug, there's that one word analysis again, she's going to explain that here, reflects the permanence of the man in his brain and by calling his brain enemy lines, he shows how memory and his consciousness have consumed and ruined him, much like what has happened to the mother in poppies. So this is an excellent example of how to link your analysis of individual words to the interpretation of the character. This one is top-notch AO2 because the ideas are linked, which makes them convincing. 
We also have a range of quotations in a short space, which means there are lots of references to the text for a high A01 mark, which is now probably just into level 6. Armitage has written a poem describing what it is like for soldiers away from the battlefield, which is untypical of war poems. To contrast with readers' ideas of soldiers' lives being glorified and highlight the support that they actually do need. This paragraph is an example of how Lily is now talking about the poet's purpose. It would be brilliant if she had also done this with poppies, even though the mark scheme doesn't say you have to compare each poem equally. So in the next paragraph, Lily is going to introduce the poet's perspective in poppies. In poppies, the sun seems to have fallen for this glorified propaganda that Armitage challenges. Weir describes him as intoxicated, viewing war like a treasure chest. This simile reflects how the government and the media glorify war, presenting it as something that can be easily won, like a child's game of pirates, and the honour or treasure that can be gained from it. This is a brilliant paragraph. It shows how to link quotations together to come up with an interpretation. And the interpretation depends on the poet's point of view. So now we have top level AO2 for interpretation of quotations and the way that they're linked across the poem and also between the two poems. So it's definitely at least developed for level five. To get into level six, Lily is going to start writing about the semantic field again. However, the mother does not seem to hold these patriotic values. Despite this, she voluntarily put herself in place of a soldier. She describes herself as without reinforcements and also as reaching the top of the hill. These terms both show how she is imagining herself with the soldiers, with her son. Reaching the top is similar to soldiers going over the top, leaving their trenches in war. So a great analysis of the semantic field, even better if she'd used the phrase again. Notice that Lily is writing a lot more about poppies than remains, and that doesn't matter. In the mark scheme, it doesn't say you have to analyse both poems equally. Now, this gives us level 6 for AO2, but we also want level 6 for AO3 context, and that will be given if Lily starts saying what the author wants us to think or feel or predict. In other words, we're predicting the son's death. And that's not something that Lily's dealt with yet in her essay. Although the mother in Poppies wishes to be able to support and aid her son, the soldier in Remains feels no support from neither friends nor social services and is left alone to attempt to cure himself with the drink and drugs. Now, for me, this is the weakness in Lily's essay. She hasn't dealt with the endings of either of the poems. It's so easy to get the top AO3 marks because an ending is the structure, and added to that, the ending always reveals the poet's final point of view. So you can go in with that metaphor of the wishbone, which describes her shape, hugging the memorial, but also we know what happens to a wishbone. It gets pulled and snapped in order to make a wish, and that's what's happening to her. She is being snapped in half by the abandonment of her son and probably his death in war. This is contrasted with the ending of Remains. His bloody life in my bloody hands. This reference to Lady Macbeth and guilt represented by the blood on the hands that can't be washed off. And then you can easily look at the poet's purposes here. Is Poppies an anti-war poem? Is Remains an anti-war poem? The answer's up to you, but dealing with that automatically gives you the author's perspective and will automatically get you into that level 6 for A03. Writing about the endings also guarantees level 6 for A01 if you do it well. For example, the exam criteria says you need a well-structured comparison. Well, you can definitely argue 
that it's not well structured if it doesn't include the endings of the poems. More importantly, there's this word conceptualised. Well, what is a concept? It is an idea that makes sense from beginning to end. You have to deal with the ending. And then there's the further clue. We want you to write about the full task, and therefore the full poem. The final clue about this is that you have to write about language, form and structure. And the ending is where the structure of the poem is most obvious and most clear. Four massive clues that you need to write about the end. And those marks are just sitting there waiting for you to scoop them up. This is how Lily writes her conclusion. In conclusion, both poems explore how war has consumed and destroyed the lives of two different individuals. These individuals remain unnamed throughout each poem, as both poets leave the reader to be able to relate to either protagonist, as they are universal experiences. That's quite a clever idea, isn't it? I hadn't considered why they're not named, and this is a very, very good reason. One is a mother whose life is plagued with thoughts of her son, who the reader questions may or may not be alive, whilst the other is a soldier experiencing war firsthand. And we could have added here, may or may not survive this memory. There is a strong inference, there is a strong implication with the bloody hands of Lady Macbeth, that like Lady Macbeth, he may commit suicide. Because this would allow you and Lily to write about the poet's purpose, these poems are anti-war protest poems. So all examiners are likely to agree that the answer has all of level 5, and then they might argue about how much it is convincing in level 6. It would probably score in the 28 to 30 mark range for most examiners. I, however, would be stingier because of the weaknesses I've pointed out, and also because I want you to remember, always write about the end, always write about the poet's point of view early doors. Also, she hasn't shown much understanding of remains, and very clearly hadn't watched my video on it. So I'm a little bit peeved, but that's just me. <laughs> so I'm going to argue that it's worth 25 marks for AO1, 24 for AO3, and 29 for the brilliant analysis of semantic fields and quotations in AO2, which gives me 26 out of 30, and that would place it on the border between grade eight and grade nine. If you would like 11 grade nine essays on the power and conflict, my study guide is cheap and available. Or you can subscribe to my newsletter and get a grade nine essay every single week delivered to your inbox. If you want to know the best poem to compare with both of these, check out the video coming up now.